Chapter 8 of Short Stories for Short People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Short Stories for Short People by Alicia Stewart Aspinwall. Chapter 8 The Shadow. There once was a shadow who lived with his six year old master, George, in a house by the sea. At least they were there during the long, warm summer. But in winter they lived in the city. George was a dear little fellow, and the shadow loved him very much. And everywhere that he went, the shadow went too. That is, when the weather was pleasant. For the shadow disliked the rain very much, and nothing could induce him to go anywhere with his master on a rainy or even a cloudy day. He would then hide himself, and when the sun shone again, out he would come and run to his master's side. They were a busy pair, these two. They ate their breakfast very early in the morning, that is, George did, but the shadow, although well and strong, never ate anything. After breakfast, they would both put on their play suits of gray flannel, roll their sleeves up to their elbows, their trousers above their knees, and would go forth bare-legged to the beach, which was about ten minutes' walk from the house. They always wore large, rough straw hats to shield them from the sun, and carried pails and shovels, and oh, what fine times they had! George's big black dog always went with them. This dog had a very sad, solemn face, and George's papa had named him Woe. He was not really sad, however, but was kind and merry, like nothing better than to play and romp with his young master. Sometimes he would lie down on the beach, and George and the shadow would fill their pails with the warm sand and pour it all over him, till nothing but his black head and his sad, sad face could be seen. He enjoyed it, and never knew how very funny he looked. One day they had a terrible time, or it might have been if Woe had not been there. But he was, and you shall hear about it. George and the shadow were building a sand house, and needing more wet sand, the boy, quite forgetting that the tide was coming in, ventured too far out. His back was toward the ocean, and suddenly, without a moment's warning, up came a monstrous wave, and striking poor little George, rolled him over and over, and drew him out to sea. At least it would have done so had not Woe, with a loud bark, jumped into the water and, seizing him, drew him back to the shore and safety. The wave, meanwhile, hurried back to the sea. He may have been frightened at Woe's loud bark, which was really quite dreadful, or he may have felt that he had done a cowardly thing in striking one so much smaller than he, and moreover, one whose back was turned towards him. The poor shadow, meanwhile, had been standing on the very edge of the ocean, shivering with terror and crying bitterly, and, oh, how delighted he was to see his master again. A few days after this they made another trip to the beach, and again something happened, which I must tell you about from the very beginning. George, you see, had built a castle of sand and round beach stones, of which there were a great many at hand and at one end was a tower. The shadow, up to this time, had been a very gentle little fellow, willing and eager to do just what his master wanted to do. But he was not very big. You must remember, at this time, he very much wanted a second tower. The two towers are so much prettier than one, he said to George, who paid no attention, but simply went on building his one tower still higher. At the top he placed a small flag which his mamma had given him that very morning. When the castle was finished, he clapped his hands with delight, and of course the shadow had to clap his hands too, but oh, how unwillingly he did it. It certainly was hard for him, for not only did George refuse to build the castle as he wanted it, but the poor shadow had to help George carry the stones and build the castle the way he did not want it. Still, he ought not to have got so vexed about it. When his master walked home that afternoon, it was a very cross, sulky little shadow that followed him. George, after supper, went to bed and supposed, of course, his shadow had done the same. 
but he was wide awake and had decided to do something very naughty. As soon as all the people in the house were asleep, out crept that little shadow through the window and across the lighted lawn, for the moon was now shining brightly, and soon arrived at the beach. Shadows, when they are with their masters, have to do just as they do, but once let them get away and they sometimes act very strangely. If you ever meet one without his master, watch him and see if he does not act oddly. This one had never been away alone before in his short life, and he felt very free and happy. He ran first from one end of the beach to the other, then danced and hopped about, and finally lay down on the sand and rolled over and over. He was dressed as he had been in the afternoon, pale, shovel, and all. At last he said to himself, Now to my business. And what do you suppose his business was? To put another tower on the castle? He knew just how to do it, as he had helped George build the other one that afternoon, you know. But the poor little fellow had forgotten that all those shadows can work very well with their masters. Without them, they can do nothing. And when you are older, children, you will find that shadow people are not the only ones who work well when the master is present, and not at all when he is absent. Although the shadow worked hard, he could not carry the sand. He could not drag the stones. He could not build the tower, for his pail was a shadow pail. His shovel was a shadow shovel, and he himself the biggest shadow of all. Then he sat down and cried bitterly. A kind-hearted moonbeam, of which there had been millions playing all about, came to him, saying, What is the matter? He told her, and shining kindly on him, she said, Go home, and I promise that the next time you come to the beach, you shall find two towers on the castle. How can you do that? he asked. But as the moonbeam had already gone, of course she could not answer this. The shadow, comforted in spite of himself by her promise, thought he would go home, but before he had gone half the distance, he was so tired that he lay down for a nap by the roadside. He meant to take only a very short nap, but he slept and slept and slept. The sun came up and dried the dew from the flowers and grass, and still he slept. Suddenly he was awakened by hearing voices. He sat up and rubbed his eyes, for there coming toward him were George's papa and mamma. With them was George, and behind him, if you will believe me, walked a strange new shadow. Our shadow ran up to him and said angrily, Go away! This is my master! No, said the strange one, smiling saucily. Look again at George! The shadow did, and saw that the boy was dressed in his best serge suit, his brown shoes and stockings, and his round brown hat, and then he remembered that this was Sunday, and that George was on his way to church. Now, said the strange shadow proudly, look at me. Our shadow did, and found that he was dressed exactly like George. Then, knowing that it was the first duty of a good shadow to dress like his master in every particular, he realized that George did not want him, dressed as he was. Had the boy turned and found him following, dressed in his play suit, large hat, shovel, pail, and all, I am sure he would have been very much frightened, although he was not a boy to be afraid of his own shadow. So the shadow stood sadly back, and when they were gone, he began to cry. What is the matter? said a tiny gray bird, who was sitting on a twig by his side, and he told her the whole story. Stop crying and I will help you, said the bird. Go first and put on your brown clothes, just like George's. I, meanwhile, will fly up to the sky and tell a friend of mine, a dear cloud, to send down some rain. Then, of course, the shadow, who is now with George at church, will have to run home. When he gets there, the rain will stop, and then will be your chance. Run as fast as your little shadow legs will carry you to your master. And even if the wrong shadow runs too, I am sure you can go faster, as he will be tired from his former run. Thank you, thank you, dear board, said the shadow. He hurried then to change his clothes, and sure enough, very soon down came the rain, as the bird had promised, and in rushed the wrong shadow breathless. Then the rain ceased, and our shadow fairly flew to the church. 
but the wrong one realizing what had happened flew too and oh what a mad race they had but as the bird had foretold the right one reached the church first and when the services were over back walked george followed closely by his own shadow he was very glad to be near his master again and began to feel badly for his naughtiness the next day off they went to the beach the shadow walking very very slowly and hanging his guilty little head i wonder if the moonbeam will have really built the other tower and will george be very angry he thought now when they got to the beach they went directly to the castle and what do you think they found the moonbeam had kept her word there were to be sure two towers one at one end and one at the other but one was a really truly tower while the other was only a shadow tower so george was not at all angry and the shadow was happy but you know he has never left his master again and the next pleasant day you meet george watch and see if his shadow is not close at his heels end of chapter eight